Um, but anyways, it can build anybody. So fingertips, yes, because it's control. But the truth of the matter is if this ball's out of my hands, I don't have any control of the ball. So we want the ball to sit in our hands more, like a Kyrie, like a Steph Curry, like a Chris Paul, where the more it sits in my hand, number one, I don't have to worry about it. Right? Like what I tell a lot of the younger kids, and this is good terminology to use if, for those of you taking notes, because um, I believe the, what you tell the player matters just as much as what you know, right? Is the hand becomes my eyes, because what do they want to do? They want to look at the ball while they're dribbling, and that's a problem. You can't read the defense, you can't read opportunities, you can't see teammates. So the more the ball sits in my hand, it becomes my eyes. Okay, and I'm not talking Allen Iverson and carrying and NBA stuff, but we want the ball to sit in our hand as long as possible. A, it becomes my eyes. Now I can get my eyes up and I can start looking at where I'm going to attack. Number two, if anybody comes and gives me pressure, I can deal with it. The more I have to dribble and the ball's out of my hands, I got to figure out how to navigate. And what happens a lot of times, especially with the younger kids, is what? Is Instead of when he comes and pressures me, me attacking and using that to my advantage, because an aggressive defender is an exposed defender, would you agree with that? Right? Is now the little kids, because they're still, they've got four, slow down, killer. All right? And it's not in their hands, what are they going to do? They're going to run away. So he's still winning. He may not have my ball, but he took away what I wanted. He's still winning. So with the ball sitting in our hand, that's number one. We can handle pressure, and we can see. Number two, I can sell and fake a whole lot better when the ball is in my hands. I can change my pace. We all know it. speed is important in basketball, but not just constant all the time speed, how well you can stop and go, right? For Steph Curry, how fast he can get into a shot, right? When uh, I work out my NBA players, we talk a lot about just the league because it's really cool to sit down with these guys after workouts and just be like, hey, man, what's it like to guard LeBron? And they all tell you it sucks, right? So who wants to guard LeBron? But um, one day we were having this big debate about who's a better ball handler, Steph Curry or Kyrie. And I'm kind of interested to see what you all think. Who, who do you think is a better ball handler? Raise your hand if you think Steph Curry is a better ball handler. No, y'all don't like. See, I'm. I like this. I, I really like that none of y'all voted for him because in America, everybody's on the Steph Curry bandwagon. So everybody would have been like Steph Curry because they just love him. I go, I'm glad y'all don't like Steph Curry. That's cool. What about Kyrie? Kyrie a better ball handler? That dude is nasty, right? He's and some of y'all just don't watch basketball or what's going on. Okay, so. The debate was this. They said Kyrie, the, my NBA guy said Kyrie, because his true ability to stop, go, sell, give you misdirection, change speeds, was way better, was, was better than Steph Curry's. The problem with Steph is Steph could get to his shot so quick that you have to play it, and he gets you to stand up or he gets you to bite, bite a little early, and then he can play you off the dribble, where Kyrie maybe is a good shooter if he's open, but he's not just going to quick pull up and knock something down on you, right? And these are the type of things we want to be able to build in these kids. Now, I know an 8-year-old kid's not going to come down and hit 15 moves. I get that. But if we get them having the ball sit in their hand more, their eyes are up, right? They can change speeds. Because what's the problem? Once they get going full speed, what happens? They either crash or burn, right? Like that, thing, that thing's coming off the backboard as a layup or it's going to the other team. Okay, so even being able to break, stop, and shift, that's half the game. That's half the game, right, at every level. So that's what we're going to work a lot on. I'm going to put these guys through it. Everybody get a ball, spread the baseline. Okay, the first thing is this. Let me, actually, let me see a ball. Give one with some air. Give me another one. Give him that one, that one right by your feet. Is we like to cup the ball. And again, this is the part I know you're not going to do this in a game. This is only to help build the muscle memory because what do they instinctively do? They have a paddle. We want to change a paddle to a cup where the hand softens up and shapes to a little bit here. Okay? It's not like when we shoot where we need it to sit. Okay? And I can still get this to come out of my fingertips. So what the first thing we do is, guys, do this with me. Put the ball out like this. I'm sorry, out in front of you. Put your wrist on top. And then, like melted wax, just let your hands shape. OK? 
Okay? Let your wrist. I want your wrist on the ball. Okay? And some will be able to do this at first and some won't, and that's fine. That's not failure. That's not success. But this is ultimately what we want to build. Now, like I said, nobody's going to be in a game running around the court like this. I get that. But this is breaking the paddle so to speak. I want to break the paddle. I want to soften their hand so when they receive it, they don't naturally receive with a paddle and they keep hitting it back or they go between the legs and they don't have anything on it, but they start to receive with a cup where now they can push their ball out. They can get to their second change quicker, whatever that may be. Now, from here we go to swings. So swings are this, gentlemen. You're going to have that wrist on top. Okay? Now, and oh, let me mention this. I know we tell them not to look at their ball and look at their dribble. The first couple stages with this, especially with young ones, but even older ones, it tell them for that moment it's okay. We're not making it okay permanently, but it's okay then. Because here's the thing. They're so used to doing it this way, they're not going to know naturally right away what it feels like if they have a cup or not. And so we actually want them to look and see the ball sitting in their hand more, their hand shaping to the ball, and then it, they, the mind starts to register, and eventually they can associate that feeling, and then they don't have to look down anymore. And that's going to be your job to kind of gauge when they progress to that. Does that make sense? Okay. Hey, I got one question. If you're in the gym with your players, and you said something like, does that make sense? And all they did was go... Would y'all appreciate that? Can I get a little love here too, right? Like I don't really, I, I hate lectures. Lectures are boring on both sides, mine and yours. Let's communicate, let's talk. That way you don't get sleepy. You're gonna engage more, you're gonna learn everything we know for the kids. Let's engage the same way. Does that make sense? I don't need y'all to yell, but man, I mean, right there, talk to me. Like, like, we'll get more out of this. Okay, so we're swinging, and I want you to look at your ball, okay? You're going to swing, and all we're trying to do with this is, A, we're starting the, the process of cupping, and also the process of getting them to understand to let the ball spend as much time in their hand as possible. Okay, so you're gonna swing. Uh, well, now you can look. Okay, and I want you because I want you to make sure your wrist is on top. I don't want it on the side. I don't want it underneath. You know, I'm still gonna preach everything about we're not carrying. I'm not building bad habits. We're not doing anything illegal as far as the rules go. So just walk. We'll walk up to about right here, guys. Right to about whatever this is right here, and you're just gonna walk and swing, trying to let the ball spend as much time in your hand as possible. Now, for some of them, it's gonna be hard for that ball to stay in their hand. What I tell them is what they'll do is they'll want to do this. Well, I need to get as many reps on this as possible because this is weird, this is uncomfortable, this is new to them. So when that happens, I tell them if you start to lose it, I want you to slam it against your hip, get your cup back, and go again so we don't lose that rep. If I just go grab it with my other hand, I lost the rep. I'm big on reps. I want to get as many reps as we can in a small amount of time. Plus, from what I hear, gym space is not a luxury around here. Am I right? Okay, so with that being said, we got to get as much done as we can at a time. Let's go, fellas. Walk and swing. Make sure you're on top looking at it. Just keep going. Okay, now for sake of time, I'm going to have them go to the next step. Usually we would walk backwards doing the same thing. Now, we've all done this before. Just walked and throwing, just playing around, just shooting it between our legs, right? Well, the way we use this now is now that's the next step. You guys can all do that, right? I know you can, man, because you, this guy right here is the next big thing out of Romania. I'm telling you right now, not just because of his size either, right? Come on, man. You got to believe that, man. You got to speak to that, all right? We'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to go through, but we're going to cup, okay? Don't receive it with a paddle. We want it to sit in our hand as long as possible, okay? Now, I'm going to show you a trick, and this is something you want to teach your kids. The softer the dribble, the harder it is to cup. So we already know we're supposed to dribble strong so nobody can take it from us and we're quick. We now want to dribble strong also so the ball can sit in our hand for a longer period of time. Because the stronger the dribble, the easier it is to cup. So when you guys, listen, this is the way I was always taught too. If we rip that backboard off the, off the wall and put it on the floor, how would you shoot at it? Like this, right? Right? That's how you're going to shoot it up there on the wall, right? 
Okay? I want the same thing. I want an extended elbow and I want a snap of the wrist. Because now I'm telling the ball where to go. Not only is it sitting in my hand, so I know where it's at, I know what it's doing, but when it leaves my hand, I'm making sure I snap my wrist. Most kids will either, what, not use their elbow at all. They'll kind of just wrist tap it, right? Or, and no wrist, so there's no control, and they kind of shove, and the ball goes wherever it wants. Or they, they don't, it's one or the other. They don't use the wrist or they don't use the elbow, right? So let's go, fellas. We're just walking, shooting it through, shooting it through, shooting it through. Now, these guys are older, so they, they're fine with just walking. We want that. Some of your younger kids are going to want to drop and open up their stance. And I know in a game, we want that. And I'll get to that in a minute. But I don't want that this with this. Because the other thing we're doing is we're switching some framework, uh, some wiring in the mind. Because who's ever seen a young kid do this when you say go between the legs? Yes, no? Okay. All right. Because for some reason, instinctively, we think the body makes the move. But that's not the truth. The ball makes the move, right? My ball goes here, and my body attacks. Because no matter how you break this down, I can't put that ball in the hole unless my body takes it there, right? And the better I can be at just attacking, or, or, or analogy we use, and I don't know how much the kids will relate to it here, but... American football, the running back, the guy who gets the handoff. He's low, so he's, he's balanced. He's strong because he's leading with his shoulders, and he's efficient. He's not running all over the place. He's straight line as much as he can be. We want to be running backs. Obviously, without breaking the rules, we got to dribble and all that. But the more I can be low here, strong through my shoulders, and not waste any motion, well, the more I get in here. That's why Kyrie's amazing. It's not just his ball handling skills. He stays a running back. Right? So that's really important to us. So they did a good job. They stood straight up. But if any of your kids start to open and drop, you tell them straight up. They can get it through the legs. I've seen eight year olds. I've seen six year olds. Well, probably not six. They're not capable of dribble. I've seen the youngest of youngest be able to walk like this without having to open up. They're just, their mind's going to tell them something different. Okay? Now, for the more higher level kids, like a lot of the NBA, WBA will do, is the next thing is if I've got this ball in my hand, I can create pace. I can change my speeds with my dribble. So now what we're going, fellas, is we're going too fast, too slow. Right? So I'm too quick, boom. So I may not cup as much or as long. And then I'm slowing it down where it sits. So too fast, too slow. Okay? Now, the strength of my dribble does not change. It's just how much does the ball spend in time in my hand. Kyrie might let it sit for a while, and his next dribble might be a little stunt dribble, right? Same principle. Let's go. So too fast, too slow. Try not to use your body, only the ball. Okay? Now, the other thing we'll do is we'll go backwards. Some of it is... We do have to back out sometimes, like Jordan, used, Jordan Kobe used to back out, right, and attack. I know your young kids aren't doing that. But also, sometimes I, I like to overload their body and their mind. Meaning, yes, they may not do that a lot in the game, but this is a whole lot harder than walking forward. But can they grasp the same cost of cupping and placing the ball? And that's really important to us. And it builds confidence in them. Because half of them are going to say, I can't even dribble backwards, right? And if you can get them shooting it through and actually doing what you want from them, all of a sudden they start believing in it more, they're buying in it more. And I'm telling you, especially because this is different, it's new, even in America, at first they're hesitant to buy in. Because especially the cupping, if they've never heard it before, and the placing and some of that stuff, or the ball sitting in their hand, they're worried about carrying, even though they're not. They're, sometimes they're slow to buy in and you got to get buy in fast because once they buy in they start working on this I've never seen anything that grows that you could grow the skill as fast as this I mean I've seen kids make a dramatic change in their ball handling in a week and that's rare you know what I mean unless you're just eight hours a day right so let's go backwards too fast too slow Okay, everyone up here to the yellow line, yellow line, right here, right here, come on, how's the fellas? 
These ones are very basic. You probably do them with your kids, but we're going to add the element of cupping and the ball sitting in our hand. And then the last element of this is, is, is the ball manipulation. So if the ball sits in my hand, I can control what it does a lot more than when it's not in my hand. So nice, strong stance. We're wide. We're low, right? Get a nice, strong ball hand stance. First one we're going to do is, is just, just in and outs. But most kids only go here on their in and outs, right? They're small, which is great, but... What if I could rock it here? And I know I may not come at this guy and come all the way in there, but here's my thing. Basketball is so spontaneous, and there's anything could happen at any time. I would rather have a whole bunch of movement in my bag that I don't need to use than need a whole bunch of movement and not have it. Does that make sense? You know, that whole, well, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it, right? So what you guys are going to do, the ball, I want the ball outside of your knees. This is another thing we're going to start teaching because most young kids, they, well, they're always on top. Well, sometimes we're on the side of our ball, right? We're controlling it in different ways. So I'm on the side, and I'm getting it outside my knees. Like, now we got what we call a side cup, and then I'm side cup here, right? But I don't want you throwing it. I want the ball to spend more time in your hands than it does in the air. Does that make sense? So if it's, it's really sitting, it's here. Go. Okay? It's not bad, they, and that's okay. Mistakes happen. Hey, pop those wrists. You're going to pop it and then move it. And you see how they're getting the concept, but they're not really aggressive with it. They're not going to realize that when this ball starts sitting in their hand, they're going to go from barely having it to being able to forcefully do stuff with it. And that's when we can really attack. We can really sell. We can get into stuff quicker. And so, guys, I want you to get more power going in it. Put some power in it. Let's go. Yeah. Keep it low. Wide does not mean high. Common mistake they'll make, too, is they'll go high. When we just need them to go wide, I still want them low. Okay? Now watch. Switch hands. Switch hands. Switch hands. Okay, we'll run through both hands. And then we'll go here. Gentlemen, we're going to go. Watch me. Watch me. We're going to go in, out, cross, in, out, cross. Now, and this will happen with a lot of your players. Don't start breaking down to a small in and out. I want every dribble outside of your knees. We're trying to build range right now. Does that make sense? So I want it outside your knees, outside your knees here. And then I also want the transition of your in and out each move quicker. So if this ball is sitting in my hand, it shouldn't be slow getting to my crossover. It used to be when we used the paddle. But now if I've got a cup and I'm here, I can snatch that thing back. Now we're building combos quicker. We're getting into changes quicker. We're transitioning from change to pound faster, right? So be quick. So it's a push-pull and then yank it, right? Go. Something like this, they'll get bored with it. These guys are already bored with it, especially the young ones. They don't want to just stay sit still. But... You know, if they show up early to the gym and you can start with them early, get them doing this before practice. Or this is your first five minutes of practice, the whole walks and this. It may be ugly for a week or two, but I'm telling you right now, this will build better ball handlers and your players. I can promise you that, okay? Now, freeze. Next thing, so they just did everything with their hands on the side, but we've got to be able to transition from on top to on the side, which is hard. That's why a lot of young players are going to what? cross over just as high as they pound dribble. We got to get them to transition from top to side. So you guys are just going to go pound cross, but look how low and tight mine is. And again, my transition here is strong because after my pound, I'm cupping and I'm yanking it through. Make sense? Go. One. One. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. Quick. Okay, and we're good. Baseline, baseline, baseline. Okay, the next step of this, and I actually had a high school player a couple weeks ago I started working with. Big, big player, down low a lot, but my belief, especially this day and age, everybody's got to be able to dribble the ball, right? This thing, they just told me they went five, they go, you guys go five out, right, in your offense? Everybody's got to be able to dribble the ball to some capacity. Now, everybody's got to be a point guard. We all got to dribble the ball. Well, this player's, this player didn't have bad hands. Like, they could make the moves with their hands, right? The problem was they didn't know how to marry their body and ball together. Like I said, 
it's not just about me dribbling the ball down there. It's about how, how aggressive can I attack with my body, right? And so they would do all the moves going through cones like we're going to do in a minute, but the body would be separate from the ball, and they lost it a lot. So this next one's going to teach them how to marry both. Because once you marry both, well, now you're navigating aggressively. That's when my cells look real. How many of you all have a player who thinks they're selling the heck out the defender with something like that? All of them, right? And they think they're doing something. They don't realize, hey, my hips have to drop, my shoulders have to shift, my core has to shift. And that's the marriage that we're looking for between body and ball, okay? So this one does that. So guys, this is real simple. I'm gonna give them a little bit of freedom. For the younger ones, I would start with just crossovers, or if they can handle between the legs, you can go cross leg and just make them do the same one over and over again. Older players, I give them freedom because I know they know how to make the moves for the most part, and it's more about decision making for them. And two, I just care about that marriage, and, and I care about that marriage while they're having to think about what they're doing because in the game, we're always having to deal with some outside force that's influencing us, so how quick can we make decisions, okay? And I'll get into that a little more. So here's what you're doing. I'm going to give you guys freedom. You can use whatever moves you want, cross, between, or behind, okay? Now, the thing you're going to do for me is you're going to stay down here in the stance, and it's a one-two rhythm, like if we were going one, two, one, two, one, two, okay? No pound dribbles, and you're just step, change, step, change. Now, put a lot of emphasis on your cup and your place, and marry. I don't want you stiff, and a lot of players will. They'll come in here it's very stiff. I want your hips moving, I want your shoulders going with you, and you're, you're, you're dancing, right? You guys know what salsa music is? Right? With a, mm, 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 I can't do it, but I'm just saying. Yeah? You should be like, I mean, we, don't be embarrassed, it's okay, they can't salsa dance either. Can y'all salsa dance? No? No? Y'all ain't gonna tell, well, talk to me anyway, I get it. Alright, let's go. Big steps, hey, strong steps, strong steps. Move your body. Cup it, place it, cup it, place it. Okay, freeze. Now, and I'm, I'm going quick through this. I would have them go back the same way. Sometimes we go full court, sometimes we go half. But now, let's put pace to it, right? So you guys may be quick and then slow, or quick, and then it sits in your hand without carrying. I want you to change your speeds, change your rhythm. Does that make sense? Okay, go. Okay, great example where this works. Uh, one of my players, Danielle Robinson. I don't know how much you guys follow the WNBA. She plays over here overseas too, like most of the WNBA players. Okay, three-time WNBA All-Star. Uh, I don't know how many times, but at least three or four times voted the fastest player in the WNBA with the ball in her hand. Just lightning fast. Like, she's here, then she's there, and you don't know what happened. The problem is... Even as she came in as a rookie and a second year player, we were working together. She, she was like the kids. She had no breaks. She didn't know when to go fast. When, like, obviously she was a little better than an eight year old, but my point is she had that same struggle, right? Or every move she had had to be fast and blow by. And so she became very predictable. All you had to do was sag, time it, and go. We started working on just the changes, first of all, that ball sitting in her hand more, and then the pace and change of speeds. Now she comes down, and she can break someone down, especially, you know, the pros. Pros are a little more isolation game. But her change of speeds, she's deceiving now. They can't time her. And then now that they can't time her, now she maximizes her speed because now she decides when she goes and she can catch them by surprise a little bit. And, and that's big. If you can get kids doing that, and I think I, if, if these were my guys, hands down I would have all of them doing that. They would all understand how to be slow to fast, change quick, change slow, hesitate, and just play that because not all of them, like I said, are going to be able to break people down with superior ball handling. Kyrie's are not normal, right? How many Kyrie's are there in the league? Right? I only gave you two names when we started comparing best ball handlers. Right? So when you get to this age, it's definitely a lot less. But guys or even girls that can stop, go, change, and explode in different ways, that changes the game. All right. Do me a favor. Give me some of those cones, please. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Make a line for me right here, please. 
Nothing magical about the drill here. It's what we're working on in the drill. Okay, we're just gonna go zigzag changes, right? But there's some things we're working on. See, they did it a lot of stationary. They did it in baby steps, and I like to start any level at that. Okay, but now we gotta start applying the game. And this is where they might have looked good. They might have got some of these concepts when we did it in baby steps. And now you're gonna now you're gonna find out how much is really sticking. Okay. And what I mean by that is we're just gonna go through changes. We'll go between the legs because it's easier for that first. Okay. Now the things I'm trying to emphasize that I want to see how well we're doing is number one, how much is the ball spending time in my hand? Right? Does it take me three to four dribbles to get here? Or can I get here in one, maybe two? Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, how fast do I transition from a pound to my change? If it's in my hand and I place it quick, I'm going to be quick. As well, am I a running back or am I standing up? Because what do most kids do when they make a change of direction? Stand up. It's with their body naturally. Just That's where our body's wired, right? So can they fight that? Can they drop, stay into that, and can they cut their angle? Most of them are going to do what? They're going to change and then turn and go, well, that doesn't beat a defender, right? So being able to change on there, okay, and then also being able to not lose and no wasted motion like we talked about, all efficiency, not letting the ball run away from us, but being able to grab it right away and place it in our next direction, that's speed. So it doesn't matter what their foot speed is. If they're getting rid of the wasted motion, they're already faster without training their foot speed. We can build speed without without doing ladders and sprints and all that, okay? Now, one thing. As ball handlers, they want to be one-handed dribblers, meaning when they do things, they only want to use one foot at a time. I'm still not sure if that's just instinctively or that's a little bit of wiring because they're, they, what are we, the young ones, what are we beating in their head all day? Don't travel out of triple threat. One foot, keep one foot down, only step with one foot. So I think it's some of the conditioning of that, right? But the truth of the matter is, and I'm not saying coming here, planting one foot and just stepping is wrong, but when you look at it, it's hard for me to open my hips. It's hard for me to drop into it and be as aggressive. If I become a two-foot dribbler, where maybe I take more of a hop, and if you watch any of these NBA players, a lot of them use this, higher-level players, and the kids actually struggle with it at first, and I'm talking younger all the way up, but once they grab the concept, it actually becomes a lot easier than the way they're doing it with one foot. So you just got to get them through that ugly phase, and then it becomes a lot better for them. But meaning, when I go here, instead of just planning and trying to open this step here, I'm actually going to split, and I'm going to pivot. Right? Split meaning if I'm here, I'm going to split. Both feet are going to come off the ground. Now, I'm not saying that negative step that they like to take out of triple threat. I'm not talking about the negative step. But just being able to stick my feet in the direction I want to go faster. Right? We do all kind of these drills with them. Why not use that to our advantage? Right? Okay? So I'm here, and I'm going to split and pivot. Pivot meaning I'm turning through my shoulders and my hips, and now I'm here. I punch the move, I'm a running back so I can be physical with him, and I'm pointing at my next spot. So now all I gotta do is push the ball, beat him with my cross step, okay? That's what you're gonna focus. Just run through it, down and back, one or two times, trying to be quick, transition, split and pivot, and just go. Now, they're gonna make mistakes. Let's look at the mistakes, let's look. Say again? You said you're a really good ball here, man. What you wanna go slow for? I'm joking, I'm joking. But that actually brings up a good point. I don't, I don't, I don't need 100% speed on the first couple reps. I don't want it. Because I'd rather they actually slow down, feel it, know what's happening with their body, seeing what's right, seeing what's wrong. If they go 100 miles per hour and I say, hey, did you feel your hips high? No. But if they're slow and they're like, oh, yeah, you know what, my hips work kind of, well, now they're self-correcting. If they're not self-correcting, you're not fixing anything. How many of you had, you told a kid the same thing 100 times, nothing changed? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Don't even hold your hand. Now, everyone raise your hand. Come on. So you've never told a kid anything? You've never told a kid something 100 times and they still didn't get it? All the time, right? And we think they're not listening. Huh? Yeah. But body awareness is hard. 
So let's let them slow down the first couple reps, feel their bodies, use it, and then they can start speeding up as they fix their, their mistakes, right? Let's go. So if you want to go slow, you can go slow. Go. So here's how we're going to do this. With him, and I want you to try this, okay? No, stay there, because we'll go down this way. So he's not bad. He doesn't really rise up, but I actually want him to drop in more. Because that's speed, and the lower I am, the low man wins, right? Low man always wins, right? So I want you to drop more, and I want you to punch it through stronger, all right? Go. This is a little better, but even still, like I, I want that move to be explosive. I want to, I'm going full speed, he comes here, bam, I'm gone, and I'm gone, right? Second thing, here, that's great, but I've got him beat now. Why am I going to be soft and slow with this dribble? Why don't I take space, right? Come here for a minute. This is a good, this is a good way to teach your kids, too. I'm going to take space to create space. I'm going to take space to create space. So after that move, I want you to push it out and create space. Go. Pivot, pivot. Turn those hips. Okay. Two things with him. A lot of your younger players are going to struggle. They just don't have a lot of hip mobility. Any way you can build hip mobility in your players, please do. Get them in situations where they have to open their hips and move. They're stiff, right? Younger players are very stiff. So you're, it's okay. You're a shooter, dog. You don't have to. No, I'm just saying. All right? So he see how he was very stiff here. He couldn't, he couldn't crank that turn. We got to get him opening. Second thing, do you, go again. Watch his feet. Watch his feet. So he's splitting, right? But where his feet are sticking is very random. So what I'm going to tell you right now is what I tell all the players. Sometimes for players, that's hard. They, they can split, but they don't know how to stick and explode out of that, right? When you shoot, you're a good shooter, right? That's what you told me anyway, right? We're going to find out in about 20 minutes here. You're not going to, on a, on, a, on, a, on a jump shot, you're not going to go one foot strong and quick and then the other one just kind of wherever, right? You're going to one, two, and be tight, right? So when you're coming through, and a lot of players are going to have this problem. This is why I'm kind of going through it. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I promise, all right? And you're going to look great when we shoot, right? Man, you shoot his confidence, man. Yes. Yeah. Don't be like them and be all quiet and boring, man, all right? So the next time he goes through, he needs to work on sticking his feet to where he's balanced because there he gets bumped he, he's done right and he's not pivot so there and then also sticking it just like a track star does so he's in the block and he's exploding out right last one let's go big dog go again watch the amount of time the ball spends in his hand he fixed it after he stumbled a little bit. He's, good. He's old enough to fix that, but watch. Very much a paddle. Okay? So he's getting in his hand, but do you see how he's even trying to find it? He's trying to find a little bit before it sticks, and then he's moving with it. So for you, you got to soften that hand, okay? Let's go one more time. Hey, and don't, I'm not going to go through like that. Let's see if you can change your corrections. What was yours? Jump down. Drop hard or explode more, right? Ask them. We need them to own their mistakes. We need to own, they need to own what they're not, what they're good at, but what they're wrong at too. Because how many times you tell them and then they forgot five minutes later what you told them? Right? Remind them of what they're working on. Let's go. Punch it. Go ahead. Punch it. Punch. Go. 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 Shift. Shift. What was yours? Push the ball out after the change. Go. Drop two. Drop. Yeah, and, that's, and he's better now. He could still probably go further with his ball, but just the fact he went from here and it's sitting to now aggressively put out in front of him, do you notice he transitioned quicker? Basketball is all about transitions. It's all about shifting, right? What was your mistakes? Yeah, get them hips involved, right? What else? Stick the feet. Stick the feet. Show me. Turn those hips. Turn them. Turn them. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Good. What was yours? Yeah, soften your hand up. Receive it with a cup, not a paddle. Go. 
play. Don't worry about it. Play, 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 play. Okay. Now we're a little spoiled. They're older, so they were able to fix things fast. Some of this stuff, the younger kids will get it, but it may take them a while. Don't feel like you failed if you walk out of the gym on day one, day two, working on this, and they still haven't really got it. Does that make sense? Now the beauty in this, they don't even need a hoop at home. They don't need to find a gym. They can work on this, right? One thing I tell my players all the time with this, especially when we're just introducing cups, is hey, when you're watching TV or whatever you're doing, right? iPad, whatever screen they're, they're putting their face in, right? It's just grab the ball and just work on just doing this. And just get natural feeling that cup, start building the muscle memory. Because once this starts happening, all of this comes really fast. The problem is they so instinctively want to hit with the paddle. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let me see here. Let me see what I got. Right on time. Okay. So this is the core of it. I wouldn't spend a whole practice on it. Or maybe, you know, I was at a workout yesterday where it's, it was kind of like preseason, right? Like it's not full season yet, we're not team practicing. So we just did skills. So if, you're, if you got a workout or an opportunity to do that, I would do the whole thing. I'd put the whole thing in or if you can find it one day where you can just teach the whole thing so they understand it. And then when you got team practice, I know what it is. I mean, you got to run plays, you got to run presses, you got to run press breaks, you got to run inbounds. But you can take whatever element of it you're at. Take the first element, the first five minutes of practice, just build it, just build it, just build it. Because if you teach it once and you don't come back and keep teaching it, they're not going to think it's important and they're not going to grow on it either. What you emphasize is what they will do, right? So that's real important. Now, this is important too in my opinion. This is kind of going to roll into what I'm talking about and how we design plans for, to develop players, okay? The truth of the matter is they can work on all these moves. But I guarantee you, if we go watch all their game film for the next three months, even though they're working on this, they're probably going to have one, maybe two moves that they're going to use every single time in a game. And it's just the way it is. I mean, I, I, you know, Daniel Robinson, is, as fast as it can be, will, more, will go to a crossover every time she, you'll allow her. She can't every time because of spacing, but if you let her, she'll go to a crossover. George Hill, phenomenal ball handler. He will go between the legs every single time you let him. If he doesn't have to go behind the back, he won't. Does that mean I don't work on that with him? Yes, we work on that. But here's my thing. We put, I don't want to say this wrong. We put too much importance on the weaknesses that we ignore the strengths a lot of times. Does that make sense? We focus, oh, he can't, he can't, he can't, he can't. Man, we got to fix that. Well, number one, it's about speed. How fast can you make change? How fast can you make progress? By the way, pick these up for me, guys, please. The cones. I'm telling you right now, you can make a player a lot better, quicker, by, by going and enhancing a strength first. Does that make sense? So... When we do the ball handling, like after we do this, and let's say we're just, you know, they're back here, and they're just coming down, making changes and finishing, and that's just one of a, a skill drill you're just doing. Maybe you're working on different finishes. For me, I want them to know what their move is. And the younger they are, they don't know their strengths, or they don't know how to look at themselves and say, hey, my between the legs is my best move. So sometimes with the younger ones, you might have to say, instead of saying, what's your best move? You might have to say, well, what do you feel the most comfortable with? Because whatever they're most comfortable with is the one they're going to try to use in the game every single time. Because we go to instincts in game, right? We don't go, oh, well, coach taught me behind the back. Let me try that on this guy. We don't do that. We just play. So if we were to do a scoring drill right here, I would go two minutes on the clock. The first two minutes, I want them to work on what their best move is. If they're a between the legs guy, then I want you to drill that into the ground because I don't want it to just be a I don't want it to just be a tool. I want it to be a weapon. I don't want it to be good enough that I can do it in games. I want it to be good enough you're not stopping it. What's Allen Iverson known for? 
killer crossover. He had everything else. A little older for my older coaches. Tim Hardaway. Not Tim Hardaway Jr. What was his move? Y'all know? Nope. That's a good try, though. At least you weren't scared to try. They called it the UTEP two-step because he came out of UTEP. But then actually now, like these days, we call it the hard way. It was between the legs, cross. Now he had variations. Sometimes he just hit you. Sometimes he hit one, hesitate, and come back, right? But it was the same. You knew Tim Hardaway was going to hit you with the UTEP two-step, and you couldn't stop it. So give them at least one move that's unstoppable, especially with these younger kids, right? They'll find success if they can just beat their defender off the dribble instead of looking down and going around people. Now, so the first two minutes will be strengths. The second two minutes would be either their weakest move, because I am going to work on weaknesses. I'm not ignoring weaknesses, okay? For, so for two minutes, they got to do whatever. They're uncomfortable with their weaknesses. The third time what I'd have them do is a counter to their str strength. So... Let's use a Tim Hardaway example. If between the legs is my strongest one, I want them to start figuring out which second move out of that combo is the most aggressive for them, right? George Hill's a great example. George will go between, and he loves to cross over back. Unless he has to, he does not want to come behind the back after that. Does that make sense? Okay, so let them figure that out. They got to own that. They got to know that. So then, because number one, it builds confidence. What's the biggest problem you have with your younger players? They don't believe they can go do this stuff sometimes with a defender in front of them, right? We started working on some stuff in a workout yesterday here. And at first they're like, I don't think I can do this. And they wouldn't. And when, once we broke that barrier and they just let go, they figured out they can do it pretty quick. You got to give them that confidence in their workouts. You can't just run them through workouts. It's, it's so much more here than it is the body. The body matters, but it's so much about what they believe happens here. Okay? Another great example. Again, Danielle Robinson, three-time WNBA All-Star. Do you know she has never shot a three-point shot in her career? She's in her sixth year. Never. She's part of it. She doesn't have to. She blows by, and being in San Antonio, her job was take the pick and roll and penetrate. Never. The only three she ever shot was last second buzzer beater from half court because she's the point guard. She's going to get the ball, right? So that was in San Antonio. Now she's with the Phoenix Mercury. Okay? Anybody know Brittany Griner? Diana Taurasi? Right? So Diana Taurasi is one of the best female players ever. Some call her the Michael Jordan of female basketball, right? Brittany Griner is one of the most dominant players inside. She gets double teamed every single time time. If they don't, she goes for 20 that night. Diana's the same way, even though she's at the end of her career. She will destroy you if you don't double team her. Okay? So, in that offense, there's some penetration for, for D-Route, for Danielle, but there's also a lot of, th this is a rule in Phoenix, if BG's on the block, it better go inside. There's no questions asked. If Brittany Grimes on the block, that ball better go inside. Or, the best players get the most touches, right? So Diana's going to get half the touches when Brittany's not touching it. So for, for Danielle, for D-Rob now, she's not sitting with the ball in her hand as much. She's not doing a lot of penetration. So now she's got to feed BG because that's the rule. And when it doubles, she's got to be able to knock this down. Last year she couldn't because why? Not that she physically couldn't. We worked on it the season before. She didn't believe she could shoot the three. She did not believe that she could shoot the three. So she would either catch and just drive, and sometimes it was the wrong read, or she would start out here on the three, and she'd step in. And that would work sometimes, and then you guys know as well as I do, a lot of times she brought herself to the defense, she couldn't take that shot, or it became a bad shot. You've got to get these kids, give them stuff that they let them find what they can do, and they can do well, and they have confidence in, and it doesn't have to be everything. Tell me one player in the NBA that does, they can do everything besides Giannis. And that's, they call him a freak for a reason. And even he's got things to add to his game, right? There's not one NBA player you can tell me right now that can do everything. No, he can't.
Okay, he's growing and evolving to that. And it seems like that because of his physical prowess, it seems like he can do whatever he wants, right? You, you, you're on the right track, though. I don't want to make you sound like, no, because then you won't answer any more of my questions, right? All right. So if they don't have everything in the NBA, why would we expect them here? Give them one or two things they are really good at and let them run with that. And build from that. I'm not saying, you know, if he's a shooter, I'm going to make him the best shooter in, 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 in the city, right? I had a high school girl. Literally, this was her range as a junior in high school. Just ridiculous, right? She had three 20-point 20, 20 games as a freshman last week. Ridiculous player, wonderful player, works her butt off. But it started with, okay, you got this thing where you can shoot a little bit because she didn't have anything that stood out. And I said, but you can kind of shoot a little bit. I said, okay, well, let's, let's take this shooting thing somewhere. You, right now, when you're all, you're going to be the best shooter on your team. So we got her there. So she's shooting, shooting. And she didn't start back there. We started up here. But then she built confidence in it. Well, now she's back here. And I know that's a lower percentage. But at the same time, how many contested threes is she getting out here? Nobody's coming out here until she hits four of them in her eye. And we built from there, and then we built her package. Well, now that you're the lethal three-point shooter, when they run you off the line, let's put it on the floor. One dribble. Let's master the one dribble pull-up. Okay, you got that? Now let's master you getting inside and finishing. She wasn't very strong, so that we didn't go there right away. That was a weakness to her. Right? I'm not trying to make her package out of weaknesses. I'm trying to build her weaknesses. I'm not making her weapons out of her weaknesses. You know how long that takes? Do you know how long that takes? Like, when, when the NBA guys come in the summer, we work on things. We're only trying to add or build one to two things. And we're going five days a week, two hours a day, for three to four months straight, depending on when they come in town. We're adding one or two things, and they're all based. It's like Legos. It's, we're just building off what they're already good at. Does that make sense? So make sure with the ball handling, yes, have them work on everything, but have them drill home what they can do, what they're confident with, because especially at the age you guys coach, when they're, there's two things they're the most unconfident with, shooting and ball handling. So get them where they're aggressive with it, okay? Um, let's get into shooting. So I'm not going to go to the breakdown, breakdown, breakdown. I'm going to show you what we build, and I'm going to show you some things that will help progress them and make them more consistent has worked at every level. So here's the things I care about more than anything else. There's a certain way to shoot, right? We can all say the feet, the hips, and all that. How many of you had a team where every kid, even after you taught them the form, they all shot the same? Like everything was the exact same. Zero, right? Because our bodies are different. My arms are longer than his. Maybe I'm weaker in the core than he is. Or there's different things. Now, there's some things that I think are, are standards you have to have in there. But if, if one kid has a little bit of a tweak in his foot, I mean, as long as it's nothing crazy. If one kid has a little bit of a tweak or, you know, I'm going to ask them to load through the hips. And if one kid goes a little lower than the other kid because that's where his core strength is, I'm not worried about that stuff. That stuff's small to me. And I feel like we, 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 we get down to that, have them having perfect form, perfect, 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 and think we miss a lot, right? Think uh, Sean Marion. I don't even know what the heck that was. Bill Cartwright? Not that Bill Cartwright was a great shooter, but heck, he made it to the league, right? Things that matter to me are feet. First and foremost, feet. I have to have my base set. Plus, write this down. And tell your kids this. Remember this. All speed and all power starts with your foot pushing off the ground. It's common sense, but we don't think like that. So a lot of kids can set their feet and they'll square to the rim, and that's important to us. But they don't, they don't spring load their feet. They flat foot them. Or they'll just set, and right now I'm light on my feet, right? Almost like I'm jump roping, which is good, but I don't have any power. If my power starts in my feet and drives through my hips, i got to stick my feet. 
So I spent a lot of time working on that. I may take the ball away from them. We may walk down the line, the younger kids, and they just work on sticking and loading and just loading. And then, again, marrying. Because the second thing to me, I want their core, but how many kids really know what their core is? And from a development standpoint, they struggle to, to work out of their core. If you notice, you've got to teach them how to work out of their core and develop their core, right? So I just tell them their hips, and they, they, they buy into that. So when I load this base, it's my feet and my hips spring-loaded. What do a lot of them do? I bet you a lot of you see this, especially off of like a one-dribble jump shot. Take emergency break, and this is, this is stiff. And then there's only two places power is going to come from. Power is going to come from your core, or it's going to come from your elbow. Now, one thing we have to break is... Shooting's not a natural human movement for us. Because what do they, they tend to do? They, they throw. That's natural for us. So we're already trying to take the elbow out of there from just natural human movement. Right? Never forget that they're human. They're going to have natural tendencies that are the same because they're the way humans are made. I don't care if you're in Romania. I don't care if you're in the United States. I don't care if you're in Sicily. I don't care if you're in Israel. That's how it is. So we got to take the elbow out. And especially when they're younger and they don't know how to use their core, and they're trying to heave the ball up there, right? And I would imagine, because this is a problem in the states where gyms are a little more available, but we put kids on 10-foot rims way too early. Way too early. And sometimes we don't have a choice, right? I would imagine a lot of you guys practice facilities. You, can you raise the rims? And, and in that case, you got to do what you got to do, right? But I'll tell you a good story that, that to me makes a lot of sense. My son is eight years old. Now, he's been blessed. This is the life he lives. <laughs> we, I mean, in a diaper before he could walk, he would sit on the corner of, of the baseline and just watch. And then when they go to water, he would try to do. He couldn't even walk yet. So he's been in this. I could put him in a gym with American fifth and sixth, seventh graders. He may not beat them one-on-one -on -one because of size, but I guarantee you he's as skilled as any of them. He worked out with some of my higher level high school kids. He may not be as consistent with knocking down shots, but he can do everything they can. But with him in my gym, I could lower the rims. So if you can lower the rims, it's not wrong. Everybody thinks we've got to get to 10 because that's what they're going to shoot on. Look, my son was shooting on this until he could do it the right way. And he was strong enough to put some range on it. Not three, but some range. And then I only went up three or four inches. Everyone was like, hey, man, he's seven. Everybody else is on 10 foot. Why are you not putting him on 10 foot? Because I don't care. Because when we went up three or four inches, his shot changed. He had to find his follow through again. Once he found it, I stacked it another one. I stacked it another one. He didn't go to 10 consistently until he was ready. Again, he was confident and he believed in a skill. And now, I'll put him out here. I guarantee you he'll shoot with, I won't say he'll out shoot these guys. And out of respect for y'all against the eight-year-old, but I bet you he can hang with form. With form. So it's really important, if you can, to do that. Because, again, the 10-foot rim, they're going to shove, they're going to shove. We have to teach them power comes from the core. So I load this base with feet and core, and then from there, I'm trying to take that power. A lot of times, what do they do? They bring the ball down here, or it's low. I don't like that because now I'm below my power. I got to have the ball above my power. I'm driving it, and then I'm just putting my hand in the rim. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids these days have never seen Space Jam. I don't know why. They all got iPads and phones, and it's on YouTube, and they've never seen Space Jam. Who's seen Space Jam? All right, y'all got to get out more, okay? Space Jam is one of the greatest movies ever by the greatest player ever. Right, Michael Jordan? Bugs Bunny's the greatest player ever? Okay. There's a scene at the end of Space Jam where they're... If you... Y'all gotta see the movie. This isn't gonna make any sense, though. This is like... Who hurts me to get? So there's a scene in the movie. Michael Jordan's trying to win the game last second. And he goes... I mean, it's a cartoon. It's like half cartoon, half Michael Jordan, right? And he goes to do his famous, like, dunk from far away, right? Free throw dunk. And he goes, but the, the, the opponent, like, they hug him and tackle him in the air. And then he becomes a cartoon. And his arm stretches all the way. And he just puts his hand in the rim, dunks it. And they win the game. And uh, he's safe. He doesn't have to stay on the planet, blah, blah, blah. Just go watch it on your own. You'll enjoy it. I don't care how old you are. Or, like, some of y'all that are too cool to talk back. And you look like you're bored. You'll enjoy Space Jam, right? So... 
I'll, all I do is that. Because here, hey, here's, here's the biggest problem. This, look, look, this is the stuff to get. I guarantee you this is the magic in shooting to me. They worry too much about aiming and trying to make the shot. And that sounds backwards. But they worry so much about that that then their brain kicks in and they try to aim. And they try to put the ball in the rim and they mess up their form. And it's really hard to get them to let go, but that's stage one of the mental side of this. If you can get them to buy in that if they do this right every single time, they won't have to worry about makes or misses. It will happen on its own. Okay? So I'm going to give you some examples. Let's do this. Because they're tired of looking at me. So give me... Come on, shooter. Come on, shooter. Go right here. Free throw line. Someone rebound. Get a couple guys rebounding for him. Give me two balls. We're going to crank two balls out, right? So give me that ball. Just shoot. Okay? Listen, I got the two balls. Here's what's going to happen. Bounce pass to me so I can kind of pay attention to him and you don't hit me in the face. You hit me in the face, we're doing push-ups and running. I know that, all right? I got some good exercises for us. Just shoot. Let's watch. He claims to be the best shooter out of the group. Is that true? I don't know. I like that he's got the confidence to claim it. That's the start for me. We're going to look at what he does. Don't get nervous now, wiping the sweat off your hands. And... Come on, just shoot. Just shoot. 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 Y'all gonna watch him and help rebound. Look at his follow through. Fellas, come on, come on, come on. Get a little organized in this. Let's go. Come on. Look at his first follow through finish. He's here. I got a chance to watch the pro team, one of the pro teams here yesterday. A lot of them finish here. And a lot of them miss. A lot of them are hard. They're very flat. Because they're trying to make the shot. Right? Here's the example I use. Here's what, first of all, I want your elbow above your eyebrow and I want your hand above your head when you finish. All you're doing is loading these hips. Okay? You've been in the weight room before, right? So it's a squat to a military press. You don't stop here on a military press, do you? No, you press it all the way to the roof. I want you to trust it. And just like a steering, you, you, are you, how old do you have to be to drive here? 18. 18? That's because y'all drive crazy. They, like, they want to save y'all for a couple more years, right? Um, no, I'm just joking. But the example I use with the kids, with the follow-through is this. When mom and dad drove you here, they didn't grab the steer and will make it work. They just held on to it and let it work for itself, and the car did what it's supposed to do, right? Kids got to learn to let go of their follow-through and just put their hand in the rim. So I don't want you to try to make a shot. I want you to just put your hand in the rim. Right? And, but I do want you to finish above your head. Ready? Just trust it. It's going to work. Trust. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I don't care if you miss. Shoot. Okay. And? I mean, you're on film. I mean, it's going to be all over the internet, but, I mean, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. That's problem number two. They care too much about a miss. And, the, and, and look, this is every level, every level, every level. They care about misses so much, they'll start changing. What are you going to change for? Right? If the car slips a little bit, are you going to grip it tighter and move more with the steering wheel? You are? That's why you're not driving. Come on, right? They, they got to learn to filter that out. They got to learn this, to just say, okay, and, and to read the ball. Okay, I was flat, so probably my follow through was flat. I had no power, I probably got to get my hips into it. And that's a lot for the young ones, but this is where you got to move them. And then eventually you got to get them to the point where, shoot, they don't care about their misses. CJ Miles, one of the best shooters in the league. I got, we just started working together this summer. CJ will adjust a little bit and, and try sometimes, but part of the reason CJ Miles is such a good shooter is he can miss six in a row, and all he's thinking about is I got to get back to my form. Where my form and I got to just get back to? And he'll find it, and then he'll crank out 20 more in a row. The best shooters have good form, some of them, most of them, but the thing they have more than anything is they don't care about a miss. They're not trying to make it. All they can control is their body, so all they worry about is their body. So let's go again. We'll forget it. We'll even edit those misses out of the film. 
Okay? They promise not to laugh this time. Right? Well, I kind of like that. That's the most interaction I've got from them all day. Okay? I don't care if you miss, make, it goes over the backboard. I don't care. Just focus on your body. You with me? Let's go. Ready? Body. Just body. That's all you care about. Just body. Up, 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 up. Up. Let it go. Up. Come on. Okay. Okay. Don't worry about it. Make one. You see how you're, you see how he's aiming now? He wants to try to put it in. Don't put it in. You have a good follow through, right? If you're the best shooter in this group, you have a good follow through, right? Trust it. Let it go. Let it go. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Oh, see, now you made him nervous clapping. Don't do that. Okay. So here's my point. He really didn't even change his form much. He still needs to build that. But the thing that I found, and I'm not some psycho deep psychologist, I don't have a degree in psychology, but the thing I've found is if you can start breaking down the mental barriers first, while you build the form, he didn't change his form, but he started making shots. Why? He stopped thinking about it. He started just letting his body do the job, right? And, and this is my point about not every shooter is going to be the same. We're going to try to push them to have the same standards and the same form, but he doesn't even have perfect form, but he started hitting shots, mainly because he got rid of this. He changed his story in here and realized he could just trust this. Goes back to the ball handling. If I can trust this move, I'll use it or I'll do it with confidence. And that matters more than anything else. So, uh, one progression I do help with form. So like for you, come here, we're gonna use it again. If they have a hard follow through, now this is a little tough because this rim's lower. I put them right here, and what we're gonna do is you gotta go above the box, but you see how mine hit rim? You can't hit rim. So you gotta go above the box, and you gotta swish. Go, I'm gonna talk to them while you do it. What I found is if they go above the box, number one, they're going to go straight up. Number two, if they have a hard follow through and they have to swish off the backboard, they start to learn how soft their follow through really needs to be. When you look at Steph Curry's follow through, it's soft. It's, it floats, right? Okay? So this is how I soften up a follow through and get him to the roof. Now, it's a little harder right here to see it because this rim's lower, so he can kind of, he can short arm it. But on a 10-foot rim, he's going to have to extend all the way. He's going to have to soft follow through, and we build it there. Now, good. Freeze. Go here. No jump. Catch ready to shoot. Are you ready to fight or shoot? Okay. And I break it down. No movement, no jump, no depth, no nothing. It's form shooting. It's nothing special. But the emphasis of what he has to do, he needs to focus on driving his hips to the roof and through the follow through, put your hand in the rim. Go. With the same. Why would you go back to that follow through? We just use that one. Up, up, up. Just let it go. Trust. And I'm going to hit him here. And I'm going to hit him here. And then I'm going to bring him back here, and we're going to do that. And then we're going to start adding one, two. We're going to start adding, okay, different stuff like that. Good. So you got it. Now I'm going to move you through. I'm going to move you through because we got to move faster, okay? So now you're going to the nail. You know what the nail is? Okay, good. Right? That's, not, that's the elbow. You're nervous, aren't you? A little bit. Why? Can't none of these guys beat you one-on-one. -on -one. Not them. I know they can. I'm talking about them. So who cares what they think, right? Can you beat them one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, so who cares what they think about you, right? Okay, so now you're going to jump. But look, hey, the thing is this. I break that down, and my rule is this. I don't care what else I make you do. Your only job is to focus on the same body. Same body. Same body. Anyone ever heard use that? Toby, uh, Kobe Bryant used to use that term, blackout? He used to not work out, blackout. He goes so hard, he blackout, right? I have a blackout too. My blackout is we get in such a rhythm and everything we're doing, and he gets so focused on his body and not all the other stuff 
that he just ends up making shots. I've had guys that shoot horrendously, and they make 900 shots in a workout in a matter of an hour, okay? So look, catch ready. Now that we understand it, hips and follow through. Ready? Hips and follow through. Go. Come on, come on. Right, boom. So we're there. Now I'm going to speed this up. We would actually stay here. We would stay here in a real workout until he got it. Now I'm going to speed this up. Give me a comb. Give me a comb. Now I'm putting his two steps into it. Start back here. So watch what you're going to do. You're going to start the cone. You're going to start the cone. Just dive in. When it comes to you, it's a two-step, but you're getting to the same low, getting to the same follow-through. Then you're going to back out, cut the other way, do the same thing. Hit him on a pass when he dives. Go, go, go. So he's one, two. Watch for these things. Watch him either to soften up his feet because he's thinking about everything else or to just to break hard and then he doesn't have a load. Watch for these things. Let's see what he does. I don't even know what he's going to do. Quick, come on, quick, quick, quick. See, he's kind of here. He's not spring loaded. Down, load it, load it, load it. Under. Good. Let's go, let's go, come on. So these are drills you know. I'm not trying, I'm not sitting here going to try to pretend like you don't know how to do a drill like this. But it's what we're focusing on. What we, are, we just, are we just running the drill? And just because he's doing the drill, he's getting better? Or what are we looking for? What are we making him focus on, right? Another one we'll do, go to the block. Uh, get out of there. So now what you're going to do is you're going to backpedal. Backpedal, I want your hips to stay down. I don't want you coming up. Stay down on the catch. Some... You, so nobody, I don't want three balls. Come on. So stick, get your hips in here. Now, is there going to be a ton of times? Go, go, backpedal, stick, catch, reset. Is there going to be a bunch of times he's going to be backpedaling and shoot? Probably not. But it's a lot. It's just like when we did the backwards dribbling. It's really hard to find your hips going backwards. So this is more the challenge of can he get his mind to tell his body to load those hips even though he's going backwards now, which is hard. He's struggling a little bit. Watch. That's not bad. Where's your follow through? Hips. Drive your hips. Drive your hips. Up. Don't aim. Let it fly. Come on. Let it fly. Up. Okay. Let's go up. Okay. Now from here, I'm going to start working off the drum. Again, I'm going through this very fast just so we can get to some stuff. I want you to come here. It's going to be a bounce pass. He's going to have one foot locked in, the other foot's back. Now, what they tend to do is they point. You got to get rid of that. Make sure the ten toes to the rim. My hips are engaged. Give me a bounce pass. I'm going to uh, give it to this hand, okay? I'm going to knock it down and low. Get into that low. Get into my shot pocket quickly because what's one of the biggest problems they have? They don't get to their shot pocket. They shoot off the dribble. Or they're slow. They don't get it off or they get blocked or whatever that may be. So now he's knocking it down. So now he's here. And it's knockdown lock, and it's the same shot. Look, I didn't even try to make that. I just focused on my form. Do it, too. Let's go. Knock it down. Back. Nuh -uh. Where's the dribble? Knock down the pass with the dribble. Dribble the pass. No. One hand. One hand. Dribble. Just dribble the pass. Do what they tell you not to do in team practice. Just dribble a catch, right? Then it's okay. Relax. 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 Dribble. Listen to what I'm telling you. You're catching and then dribbling. Watch what I do. Dribble the pass, lock it. Okay? Now, how we build off that is this. A little more difficult. And sometimes, especially this day and age, sometimes we're shooting off changes, right? Is now we call this lock, load, lift, because that's exactly what I want him to do. I want him to lock, load, and lift. So now, uh, give me a chest pass. Wait till I, wait, wait till I clap. So I'm ready to shoot. I catch, and again, I'm working on my two feet split. I'm dropping into it. I'm placing, so I'm also getting some ball handling done. And I'm here, and I'm load, lock, and lift. And then I'm coming through the other leg. Things that will go wrong. They'll stiffen up their legs. They, the hardest thing is they won't get their core under the ball, or they'll be slow getting to their shot pocket. And those are three things I want to get. I want to get the good base. I want to lock it. I want to drive it through the roof. You got it? Actually, you know what? Not that you did a bad job. Come on. I'm beating you up this whole time. You got to get some of this, too. 
You understand what to do? You sure? Because you stand straight up. Okay, let's watch some things. Watch his feet. Go, keep going. One thing, when I was a player, my trainer used to tell me, and he's old school, he's, he's older, he's probably in his 60s, 70s now, back when they had phone booths. Y'all still got phone booths? Like pay phone, phone booths? Superman gets in the phone booth and dun -dun -dun. The young guys are like, what the heck is a phone booth? Okay, I got a smartphone. So his saying, because he's old school, was stay in your phone booth. Remember we talked about the split and how well you stick your feet? Watch his feet. Go back and do what you're doing. You're probably going to fix it now because I tell you. Okay? That's going to come out somewhere in a game. We got to fix that now. Watch me. Look at me. Look at me. You're here when you split. Right? That's not a split. Right? So I want you to stay hips here. And I want it to be. Remember when we walked? It was the least amount. It was the least amount of movement possible, so I want you tight. I know you don't know what a phone booth is, right? But imagine I put this box around you. Stay in this box. Come on. Tight. Tight. Punch that move. Punch it. Punch it. Look. Punch lock. Punch lock. Come on. Come on. Punch lock. Now, look, the other thing is, I know I'm showing a lot of individual stuff. You got to find ways you can work on this in groups, too. I'm going to show you some group workouts here at the end, but <clears throat> I at least want to show you the premise of what I'm trying to focus on when I'm building. There's ways to do this in groups. Um, there's ways to do it individually, obviously. But if I'm you and I'm thinking, okay, I don't get a kid by himself or I don't get a group, small group of four, if I'm you, I'm starting to think, well, how do I how do I make this so we're not just bored and everybody you know because you put you put seven eight eight year olds nine year olds in a line you're not getting anything done right they're gonna pick their nose look at everything else start pushing each other all that good stuff right okay so maybe if there's a passer there's a rebounder be resourceful right so now you're gonna pass here go there okay let's let's just imagine you're not in this to make this easier. I promise I still love you, man. I'm not getting rid of you. Okay? So you pass, you rebound. You feed him, you feed him, right? Okay. Now, what's he going to do? He's going to be lazy, isn't he? He's just going to go. So, no, he needs to work on passing. He needs to step and snap. I don't care how old he is. He needs to step and snap. Especially this day and age, when all they see on these screens is shooting and ball handling and dunking, they forget how important passing is. Everybody needs to work on passing. And a lot of you have the younger kids. That's their biggest downfall, isn't it? You can't, half of what you can't get done is because either A, they can't dribble or they can't pass. Am I right? Are y'all that bored? Y'all don't want to talk to me no more? Especially this section. Y'all looking at me like you, you just, it's lunchtime. Like, we're going. No? All right. We'll stay on this side. But he's working on that. Same thing with him. He may not just be getting the ball off the rim. You may, I'm going to make you, you, you need to tear it down, pivot out, and kick. Ready? Go. Tight, tight, tight. Stay in your box. Stay in your box. So now you're working on three to four different things at one time while this guy's getting shots. Or you got nine, ten kids, make lines of these three and have them rotate. They go to a new station every time. Common sense stuff, right? Okay, let's move on. Hold off, guys. Hold off, guys. Let me look at my notes real quick, make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. Eventually, let's go back to the mind for a minute. Eventually, they're going to get over the fear of a miss and the pressure of that, right? But there's a whole bunch of other pressures that come involved. So when I started working with, like, all my pros, George and CJ and Danielle and all these ones over here, I said to myself, how am I going to help them? Someone like, especially like a George Hill. I mean, I know basketball. I know how to train people. But... I got to go in the gym and show this guy I know enough to give him value because the second he sees that I don't have any value, if that's the case, he's gone. And I lost my opportunity. So I'm thinking to myself, well, this guy's been in the NBA for seven years. What the heck am I going to teach him? You know what I mean? And then I thought about it. I said, well, 
First of all, I'll look at his mechanics. If there's anything to fix, I'll fix that. He's a good shooter. He's a really good shooter. He was leading the league in three-point percentage this season and has at times the last few years. So he had a little bit of a load in his knees. We fixed that. And then I said, well, what else are we going to do? How do I keep him entertained? Those guys get bored just as quick as a nine-year-old does, believe it or not, because they've been working out all their life. And then I said, well, man, first of all, you got 20,000 people watching you. And if you're, if you're, and it's a way game, they're yelling all types of crazy stuff at you, right? Saying things about your mother and everything else. If it's a nationally broadcast game, or you, maybe you're playing the Warriors, you're playing the Cavs, there's a little more pressure to win. Maybe it's a contract rear where if you don't put up your numbers, your paycheck doesn't match your numbers. There's a lot of pressure that goes in to being a pro and playing, right? And I'm kind of excited because my trip here, I'm actually bouncing around. I'm going to go to Sicily, Israel, Brussels, Hungary, and then I'm going to go home. And I'm going to see all my pro players. I can't wait to see what it's like in European arenas. I see it through the, through the computer, and I like, I mean, there's drums banging. I, I'm excited. It's going to be fun. But that's pressure. I don't care how good of a player. You may be able to tune that out to some degree, right? But that's a lot of pressure. And then you're dealing with great defenders. And then kids are worried about what? I'm going to make a mistake, and coach is going to sit me, right? There's pressure. So now what I started doing with, like, I started with the NBA, and then I toned it down, and I'll show you. <clears throat> is everything is pressure, mental pressure. If they got the form down, if they struggle with their form, just get them to stop worrying first. But we'll do different stuff. And some of it's common sense. Some of it I think it really works well. So here's the deal. You're going to shoot now. You're going to pass. You're going to rebound. Okay? You can't leave this spot till you make five in a row. Now, he may or may not succeed right now, and that's fine. Okay? But we're going to have him do it. I should have him shoot without pressure first, but go, shoot. We'll see if he can do it. But you'll be able to see it in his form. Like, watch, watch around if he makes three in a row, four in a row. Watch how tight he gets. Okay? That's the stuff I'm trying to get rid of. I'm trying to get rid of the pressure when it's the fifth shot or the fourth quarter shot that matters. I want him to... F did you make five in a row? Okay, so, so let me ask you something. Is that your teammate? I, I know. <laughs> so if he's not doing his job, can't you talk to him? Because you seem mad at me when I asked if you were done. <laughs> it's not my job to communicate to him. All right, keep going. So this is what I'll start small. Now, with a group of young kids, maybe we're just trying to make two in a row together. Right? Or if, if we can get three. And then here's the other thing I like about these. Now we can track progress. So someone like CJ might come in, good shooter. He's got to make seven in a row wing threes. Well, if that gets easy and he gets it on the first attempt or if I put him on the clock, okay, well, next week, now you got to make nine in the same amount of time. And now all of a sudden we're tracking progress. And that, guess what's also happening? He's gaining confidence in himself. He's already a good shooter. But when you help good shooters get even more confident, then they get lethal. Then they'll hit everything. That's when my one high schooler went from hitting everything to here to, well, it's okay, I'm right here, I'll shoot this too. And make it. And make it. I'm not encouraging kids to run off eight feet off the line. She was special. She was unique. So that was once. We might do that. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter. No, 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 really understand me. I'm not being funny right now. It took a while, didn't it? Who cares? D did it change anything? Nothing, right? You're still on the team. You still got the jersey. Everything's fine. There's a point in that. There's a point in that. They all want to be perfect. And then what happens is they screw things up even more when they're not. They forgot that they're human. Last time I checked, not, not one of us are perfect, right? None of us. But they think they got to be perfect, especially the higher levels they get. Man, they think they got to be perfect. So here's what happens. The higher levels, they think they got to be even more perfect, probably because there's this huge demand on them. So they get even more mad when it happens. Now, they move on a little quicker. The young ones still think they need to be perfect, and they don't know how to handle their emotion.
right? My son especially, he thinks he needs to be perfect. He misses. I give him advice. No, 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 no. Man, just do it. He thinks he needs to be perfect. They don't need to be perfect. And here's the deal. What you got to understand is this. You, have, what you, you didn't go through a bad version of it. What I call you went through the fire. Right? How do you build a diamond? What has to happen to a diamond to become a diamond? Huh? Pressure has to go through the fire, right? You went through the fire. You became a better shooter by being persistent. Confidence and persistence. Confidence and persistence. How many players you know they missed two shots? They didn't shoot the rest of the game. Not because you didn't tell them, because they just shut down. Anybody know that? I'm just seeing if I can get one hand on this half. Y'all just... That make me feel so welcome to Romania. No, I'm, I'm joking with you guys, but it would be nice if you interacted. Okay? And there's going to be sometimes you do this that you may not get it. It may take you 15 minutes. Now, you may not have the luxury of 15 minutes. You may have to move on. And But I like sometimes too, like sometimes I think us as coaches, we get too caught in, you're going to do it till you get it. And it was, on paper, it was a five-minute drill it turned into a 25-minute drill, and then you're going to do half the other stuff you're supposed to do. Sometimes they got to be able to accept loss and learn from it and grow from it and build thicker skin from it. They've got to be able to accept loss. So you didn't lose. You got it, didn't you? just took longer than you expected because it wasn't perfect. We don't got to be perfect. We got to make progress. So what would matter to me is if I, I let them do it again, we're not because we got to keep moving, is the next time you do it, do you do it in less attempts? Maybe not the first time, but if it took you six times last time, can you do it in five? I just need you to get 1% better every time you do something. Now it's like, oh, well, that's all you need from me, coach? Oh, that's, do you see the weight that just came off his shoulders? Oh, that's it? Just 1%? Because if he gets 1% better and 1%, even if he gets 1% better each day, he comes five days a week, that's 5% in one week. That's growth. That's 20% in a month. Right? I know the numbers don't completely add up like that, but get them to think about just 1% better. Just stop being perfect, just 1% better, and you're good. Right? And then if you are, you're going to build confidence, aren't you? If you did it in four times, okay, good, right? So here's another one. I call this one-minute shooting. Dude, I said hang out, not check out. Okay? Big man, you're going to shoot for us now. I don't care where you shoot. Shoot wherever you want to shoot. We're going to bring you back in. You get the pass. You two are going to work together to rebound. You feed him with bounce passes. One-minute shooting I like because it adds a little bit of cardio. And it's hard to put up 20 straight shots in a row. 20 shots, 20 shots. And... At first, I may not tell them he has a number to hit. So he's going to go for a minute. Let's count them, but there's no minimum. Okay? Go. Number one, watch how his form breaks down about the 30-second mark. So the number one thing is, can I shoot through fatigue? Can I shoot when I don't have my legs anymore? Can I shoot when my arm's burning, right? Can I shoot through all that? Can I, can I ignore that? Right? And then when we start putting a goal on him, now he's got pressure. Especially when they do it enough, they start to know when that one minute mark's coming. And if they're at eight and they need 14, they panic. And what I want them to do is not panic. I don't know what he's doing right now. Okay, good. We'll say that's one minute. That's 40 seconds. Okay? You can stay right there, but now you have to make 12. Okay? I'm going to tell you guys when time is running out and just kind of gauge him in your head. And based on where his number is at, if he's hitting, watch how much confident he's shooting. But if he's missed a few and he knows he's got to find those last few shots, watch how he changes. Watch his form. Watch his tightness. Watch his follow through. Watch how he changes. Go. Or even now that he's missed four in a row, watch how he changes. Half 
halfway. Where we at? How many do you have right now? Nobody knows how many he has? I got people in the stands that know how many he has. You guys are supposed to be counting for him. Ten seconds. Watch this. Ten seconds. This dude's ice cold. He's actually pretty good. He just can't shoot. But even now he's trying to, right? All right, freeze. He was pretty good. He's actually pretty calm, right? But a lot of them will start to panic. That's the fire I want them to go through. And they may fail at first. I don't care. I want them to fail. Because they're going to build thick skin, they're going to build mental toughness, and the next time going in, they're going to say, okay, I got it this time, and that resilience builds. <clears throat> and then when they do get it, they build the confidence. It logically makes sense to me. I didn't know how much of a result I would get from it, but like I told you, the first time I ever got in the gym with George Hill, I said, how am I going to help this guy? So we did a bunch of this stuff, and I got some other ones I'm going to show you. His three-point percentage went up. 3% over his career average. The next year it went up. This year he's shooting six, he's shooting, he's either shooting 4% higher than last year or 4% higher than his career and then the other one's 6%. So it's either 6% over his career average, I can't remember right now, or 6% higher than last year and then the other one's 4%. There's not anything special. There's not some magical drill I do. I mean, yeah, we do these specific ones, but it's more about how strong do I make him here? How confident do I make him here? How much can he handle that pressure? You get him doing that and things change, even for the younger kids, right? So you've probably seen this, right? Who's put a, a team, a team of young kids on the clock and said, we got to make seven layups, right? And they'll change in their form or they'll try harder or... What do they start doing? They start yelling at each other or, hurry up, pass me the ball. And they, and they panic, right? Well, if they do it then, what do you think they're gonna do in the fourth quarter when they're down two and they gotta make a bucket? Hey, hey, come on, set the screen. Instead of just staying calm and just running your system or doing what they've been taught to do. So you gotta break that now. Because your instincts will kick in in the game no matter what. Your instincts and your training will kick in in a game. There's no time to sit and think and wonder. And you do that when you sit down. And who wants to sit down, right? So you got to train these situations. You got to build their mind. Here's another one we're going to do. So we did in a row stationary. We could do it off the dribble. Or I'm going to make you do three different things, right? So you're going to shoot here. Then you're going to, and make sure you guys know this too. And make sure you count for them. Catch and shoot there. Catch and shoot here. And then you're going to get another ball here. And you're going to go one dribble on the elbow and lift. And then you're going to recycle. Okay? Now, you've got to make all three shots together in a row. Now, for sake of time, I'm only going to give you three chances. Okay? Ready? Go. Actually, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You go in there. You're actually calm. You're not helping my cause. Like, I need someone to actually mess it up. I'm not saying you're going to mess it up. But this dude's like, he has no emotion. He's good. Listen, catch and shoot. Catch and shoot. One dribble jump shot. Okay, here we go. Go, 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 go. So different changes. It's easy to catch rhythm in the same spot, shooting the same shot. So it almost becomes like a cheat code. Like it gets easy to, oh, I got rhythm. I can do this. I can do this. But when you start, keep going. Go until you get it or until I stop you. But when you got to move, you got to change, you don't have any rhythm, which most times in the game you don't have rhythm, right? Because I sprinted down here. I played defense. I ran the lane. I got the ball. I kicked it. I came off the screen. Now I got to shoot. There's no rhythm. Did you get it? My man. That's good. I'm like, I'm sad. I'm going to have to go back and watch it after this because I didn't get to see it. I feel bad. Okay. Another way you can do this. So with D-Rob, the, the biggest thing we worked on, obviously, was shooting threes. 
this this off season, right before she just got she just signed in Hungary. Um, I'm not gonna try to say the name of it because then I'm I'm gonna sound very American and I don't want to sound dumb. So, um, but. All we did was work on threes. So for a month and a half, we did everything, right, with threes. And then she took some time off, holidays, and then pros like to just leave town and disappear for, like, weeks and then come back. Just what they do, okay? Um, and then she came back for about a week and a half before I had to come here. And I knew she was going to end up going to whatever European team she was going to sign with. So it was like, okay, we only have this much time to get something done. So this is one of the things I did. This is a little more advanced. I don't know how much I would do this to elementary. But you can kind of, you can build it in different ways. So she had to, I will make you guys do it. So she had to come off a down screen, flare out of it, shoot the three, right? She'd shoot the three. And then I would come into a dribble handoff with her. And she had to go behind, shoot the three. And then I'd give her another ball, and she'd immediately go into pick and roll and shoot the three behind the screen. But she had to make all three of those shots in a row four times. Okay, I'm just trying to give you some other examples of how you can scale it and make it harder. Or, you know, for a kid, so yesterday in this workout we did, right, they were working a lot of passing and just cutting. So maybe it's something simple like they have to cut, Make the layup, pop out to the wing, get into a one dribble jump shot, and then maybe they back out and shoot a three, if they're capable of that. There's different ways to simplify it, know what you have. And I'm going to get into how you kind of design things for players right now. But that's a lot of stuff we work on. I, I want to make sure, give me two seconds to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, that's a lot of them. Um, Okay, we're going to modify this. I do want to show this drill. Because, number one, this is great for conditioning. This is great for pressure. And you can run it for one person. You can run it for two people. You can run it for a team. Okay? So we're going to run it two on two. So you go in this corner. You're his partner rebound. You're his partner rebound. Go in the corner. Rebounders start with the ball quickly. This is called M drill, because you run the route of an M, okay? Normally, they would go from corner to half court. They'd have to touch half court because of spacing. We can't do that. And this can be done by yourself, or this can be done, like we said, with a team or group. So you guys are going at the same time, right? So what's going to happen is, don't, don't, but we shoot three here, okay? Now, for the younger kids, it can be a mid-range, right? As soon as you shoot, you're going to sprint. You're doing the same thing. You're going to sprint. You're going to touch. You're coming top of the key. Three. Okay? Or again, younger kids can go to the free throw line. And then we're coming here. You're going there. We're crossing past. I'm touching. I'm shooting corner. Now, if this was one person, they would go continuously on the clock until they had five or seven. Five or seven, the best numbers to hit. Again, on the clock, you can track progress. When it's team, I actually like team better. Clock and by themselves puts a lot of pressure on them, A, because they don't get a break, because they're going to swap out after they shoot the three shots. And there's still pressure, but there's nothing like the pressure of competition against the person. There's nothing like that. So now it becomes a race, and they work even harder. But a lot of common mistakes also come out of that by the pressure and how they handle the pressure. Then I like it, too, because we can address those. So as soon as you go through those three shots, we switch out. Does that make sense? The first team, so you're going to add your points together, add your points together. Every make is worth one. We'll go, for the sake of time, first to five. Ready? Go. Let me get out of your way. Touch. Sprint, sprint. Come on, let's go. It's a race. It's a race. Let's go. The biggest mistake all players make in this drill is because they're either on the clock or racing, is they go and they just jack the shot up and go. Which we don't want that in a game. Right? So you got to really emphasize, get there, finish your shot, and then hustle to the next spot. What's the score? One. Trust your father.
Go, go! Quick, quick! Quick! What's the score? 3-3? Three, three. Quicker, guys. Quicker. Let's go. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to win. See, a lot of my rushing is just going and going and going. All right, freeze. Freeze. It's all right. We're good. So, like, with teams... Because sometimes I work out teams, and I've coached teams as well before in the past. I'm not a big fan of just getting on the baseline and doing sprints, because that's not even the full. That's not even the full realism of the cardio that you got to have, the kind of condition you got to have in basketball. You don't just run. This isn't track, right? This isn't cross country. Like you run, you cut, you stop, you break, you jump, you shoot. Like that's where the conditioning comes in from the game. Right? How many players do you know that tell you, oh, I run two miles a day, coach, and they come in the gym and work out, and then they, because <laughs> it's a different cardio. So instead of at the end of a practice making them sprint and just do, do that, have them do, that was tiring, wasn't it? Whatever, man, y'all are not helping me. Didn't we agree y'all were going to agree with everything I said? No, I'm joking. We're good. Okay. They only went for a little bit of time. They would be tired. And if they can do, if you do small numbers, they get, they're exhausted. Okay? I've seen the NBA guys, WNBA guys, they get done. They do it by themselves, and they're sitting against the wall. You know, it, it's, it's a good one. There's another one. There's an X drill where they start on the wing. You start on the wing. You shoot. You go and touch opposite, and you shoot. Then you go touch opposite and shoot. I don't like that as much with groups because then they collide and they're bumping heads a lot, but by themselves it's really good. And what it does is it actually higher level thing, but it simulates, let's say I'm the, I'm the two, right? So when the game started, I was matched up with the other team's two. But our three couldn't guard the other guy's three, and so coach said, no, I want you guys to switch. So the two still might be guarding me, but I shoot this shot, their three goes, well, I've got to fly and i got to go get to the three. So it's, it's shooting and getting to your cross-course matchup, right? And that's a little higher level, but that was the principle behind it. Um, so that's shooting, okay? I know a lot of that you're going to have to kind of figure out how to plug into your system, plug into your kids, plug into your level. But to me, I thought that was better. Because if I gave you a bunch of drills, I mean, I gave you drills, but if I gave you just drill, 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 you might go, well, that one doesn't apply right now. That one doesn't apply. I can tell you that everything I've said as far as, like, the principles, the psychology and all that, it applies to all of them. You just got to figure out where they're at with their level and what part you got to push. No matter what level they're at, I guarantee you, build confidence. Teach, show them, in America we got this saying, when, when a player's like really using their go-to stuff and, and they're really killing people, James Harden and all them, they call it, that player's in his bag. He's in, and basically it's like short for he's in his bag of tricks, right? We all know that saying, right? If they don't have a bag of tricks, they're not going to give you much in game. I can promise you that. So within what I've taught you, try to figure out what you can get. Now, here's how I, I, I believe we should develop players. It's my philosophy. I'm not saying it's the end all be all. I know not everybody has the same. I just know it's worked for us at every level for a lot of players for a long period of time, okay? And it starts with what I've been preaching with already is figure out what their strengths are first and foremost and evolve them while you figure out how to fix the weaknesses. When a player comes to me in my program, the first thing they have to do is an evaluation workout. Okay? And in that evaluation, what happens is I work them out for 30 minutes. It's a very basic, generic workout. Show me some one dribble jump shots. Show me your catch and shoot. If you're a big man, show me your post moves. Show me how you pick and pop. Show me, show me, show me, show me. Not a lot of teaching, but I, I'm looking, I'm hunting. But even before that, I'm asking things like, like I did with these guys. What's your role on your team, right? What'd you tell me? 
Okay, you're a finisher for the team. What's your role? Finishing. Well, I know you're all supposed to finish. So you tell me you guys suck at shooting then. Your team sucks at shooting? Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going quick with them, but I would break this. Now, now, but this is a good point, too. Do you see how they kind of knew what their role was, but they, didn't, they couldn't really define their role for me, right? They all think they have the same role, right? You'd be surprised how many kids are the same way. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get to them. And for you, if it's your team and they're your players, define it more. One of the biggest weaknesses I see in all team coaching is we don't define their roles for them enough. And then, like in America, because every kid thinks they're going to college and NBA and WNBA, they go, "Oh no, you can't put me in a box because when I'm four years older, I gotta be the point guard." Nope, you're still gonna be the three, right? But if you're their coach. To help them define that role and let them get good in that. I told you in the off season with the NBA players, we get good at one or two things at a time. A role lets you do that with them. And I'm not saying if if he's a if he's the best shooter on the team, three point shooter, yes, we're gonna work a ton of threes for him, especially within the playbook. If he comes off down screens, he's gonna shoot that down screen three and the down screen curl until his legs fall off. I want him to be great at it. I don't want him to be okay at it or the guy we're settling for doing it. I want to know when I call that play, 70% of the time he's knocking that thing down for me because then I can count on him. That shooter I told you about, man, I had six plays in the playbook for her. Because why? Because she's going to hit it every time. So I'm going to have six plays. We're going to get threes every chance we can. I had a big that was big and strong on the same team, big and strong like him. You couldn't boom, 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 just work. We had plays for that. And then what happens is you teach them because everybody what? Everybody wants to play drawn up for them, don't they? Right? So the carry on the stick for them is this. Man, look, I need you to get really good at threes. If you get really good at threes, I got this awesome play in my book that I want to have. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to go shoot threes all night long. He's going to shoot threes before practice. He's going to, and I'm not saying that's the only thing I want him to do, but I need him to get good at something, really, really good at something. Because, look, here's the thing, too. What do we do? We're selfish. We're selfish. Because we only think about what we need them to do for us. I had a great conversation with some coaches. They're actually here, and we were talking about some of the problems of the progressing through the levels is, a lot of coaches are just worried about that season and what the kid can do for them right now. And they're failing the kid because they're not ready for what the next their next role is going to be. Or if they have the same role and they're still a shooter, how they're expanding that strength because at the next level they got to be able to do more with that, that shooting ability. Does that make sense? You got to think next for them. You got to think now. You got to think next. You got to give them a role, and then you got to show them how to build it. If and I do now, I'm asking because I'm still learning the dynamics over here. Okay, so like for me in America, I can have club teams too of any age, and then I can train players who don't play for me. They just train with me, or they can do both. And I'm I'm finding it's kind of similar here. Is that right? Are a lot of you in that position, or no? Are you guys just team coaches? So it pretty much all comes from the teams. Uh, okay. Got you. Got you. Okay. I, I, maybe I just misunderstood how the how those clubs were built together. Well, then if you're the coach, it's your job. You're failing the kid if he doesn't have a role. And I know you like to win, right? Who, watch this. Let's see if we can get everybody's hand this time. Who here likes to win? Okay, you're a loser if you don't raise your hand. So you're the winner or loser? Loser? You okay with that? Oh, look, dude, just keep it. Like, it's, it's a hand, right? Well, here, here's my thing. If you're not even going to give enough effort to call yourself a winner or like to be a winner, that makes me wonder how much effort you're putting into actually helping your kids win. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you're too cool to raise your hand to say, I like to win, 
That tells me you, and I'm not trying to call you, I'm not trying to beat you up, but that tells me there's a good chance you're too cool to work hard enough for these kids to help them win to, to the level they could. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe you're not doing nothing, but are you doing everything you can? You see what I'm saying? And that, that's just the principle with everybody. We don't want any kids that are too cool to talk or communicate or too cool to go get a rebound. We can't be the same way, and I'm not just talking to him right now. Right? Do this extra work. Yes, think X's and O's, but uh, another conversation I had yesterday was someone told me a lot of what happens around here, and I'm not saying it's you, but is they only think, oh, I got to have the perfect plays. I got to have this many screens, and if it has this much sophistication, they'll never figure out what we're doing. But they don't do any skill within that play, so when the kids shoot the shot, it was magnificent. There was 18 screens and a cut and a reversal, but nobody can make the shot. So how good is your play? I'd rather take some simple basic play where I know the kid's going to knock down the shot because he's built skill within that play, and they're going to be more successful, the team's going to be more successful, and then I can be more successful. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to get you to think in ways that I promise you if you apply this to what you're doing. That's why I didn't give you a bunch of drills. You can go get 1,900 drills on YouTube. We live in the most the most advanced time ever as far as knowledge and technology you can go get a million drills on YouTube but the thing is it's not it's not the drills it is to some degree but it's not it's what are you trying to get out of those drills what are you trying to accomplish are you trying to fix pressure when they're shooting are you trying to build confidence when they're dribbling are you trying to help them know their game to where when they go in the game they can produce that for you, and on top of that, when they go try out for that next team, or if they're blessed enough to try out for one of these national teams, they walk in the tryouts and can go, Coach, watch this. I'm going to show you. I'm your shooter. And they got the ability to do it. They got the confidence to do it, and they show it, and they get that honor of representing their country, which I think is one of the coolest things. Yes, we have USA basketball, but it's such an, an elitist thing in America that so many kids don't get that honor. I'm honestly trying to bring my kids over here and go to multiple countries, and I'll come back here as long as y'all promise to raise your hands. No, I'm just joking. That's not funny anymore. I got it. All right. And I want them to see 15-year-olds that represent their country. I want them to see 16-year-olds that represent their country. I think that's amazing. That's stuff we should be working for them. And not every kid won't be there. Some kids are going to be short. Some kids are going to be slow. Some kids aren't willing to work hard enough. But are we pushing them to whatever ne next is? And are we helping them get to next? Okay. Um, I'd like to open. Does anybody have any questions? Anything? Anything you want me to rehash here? I know I gave you a lot. A lot of people are ready for lunch. What's up? Yes. I'm going to take space to create space. Can you? Okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, come here. Give me the ball. Just you. Unless you want to get you want to get dunked on? Who wants to get dunked on? I'm joking. I'm not going to dunk. Come here. So he's not going to play me right here. Because if he plays me right here, he's, he's exposed, right? He's too close. So what's he going to do? About one arm length away, right? That's, is that what you guys teach your two, one arm length away? We teach one arm length away, okay? So he's, he's creating space so that he can stay in front of me. If I don't take that space from him, I have to go around and I don't win that battle. So I have to be able to get in here. Whatever it is, triple threat or off the bounce, I have to be able to take this space back from him so that I can get to his body. That's why I said that's why I said earlier in ball handling, it's not just about the dribble, it's about I attack him with my body. Right? So I have to take the space and be able to control him body to body. And now that I've got leverage, I can create space. So I gotta take that space back from him that he wants, and then I gotta create new space. Okay? You said you had two questions? Yeah, you hop split. And, and look, I used to teach, I used to teach the one foot way, right? And we found success. And then I just, you know, I'm always learning and studying, going to coaches' clinics and stuff too, or studying online as well. And I, I saw someone's philosophy in the split and the two feet. And then I went and I looked back and I looked at like high-level players and I saw what they were doing, you know, even high-level high school and all that. 
and I saw a lot of them doing it, and I saw the efficiency and, and the aggressiveness in it, and I just bought into it. So I'm not telling you one foot is wrong. I just feel two feet is better. It's like, you know, some coaches believe that you should hop into a catch like J.J. Redick, and then a lot of coaches believe you should two-step. And I've seen players be successful at both. But I just feel the two feet are better in the hop and split, yes. Any other questions? None? Y'all got it? Everything? Okay. Last thing real quick. Um, again, this is an honor to be here. This means a lot to me. Um, to come to a whole other country and be able to share the knowledge, and it's not even an American thing, Romanian thing, it's, it's a basketball thing to me. And to me, basketball means a lot. It's a blessing because, yes, this is my livelihood. I feed my family from this. I get wonderful opportunities like this to share with people like you that are like-minded. But basketball also saved my life at one time where I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. Okay? When I was young, I had a lot of things go wrong, and basketball was able to give me an opportunity to come out of that, and, and then I, I was able to turn it into this. So basketball means a lot to me. So the last thing I want to leave you with, and look, whether you paid attention to everything or you paid attention to nothing, my college coach, college was actually the first time I truly played organized. I played a little organized young, like some youth league stuff, but then I got in a lot of trouble, and then basketball, the whole, I'm not going to get into that story, but basketball saved my life. I wouldn't even be a free man if it weren't for basketball. I'll put it that way. When This is when I was young and dumb. Not now. I don't, I'm a good guy now, okay? But my point is this. My college coach, I'll just tell the story real quick. He had a meeting before tryouts. It was his first year at the college. And he says, we're going to write, I'm going to give everybody an index card. And he said, you're going to write down your name, your phone number. I don't think there was email back then. But and all everything you've accomplished, all state, all district, leading scorer, state champion, whatever. Well, I look around and all these other players, they're writing and writing and writing and writing, and my heart sank. Because what am I going to tell this guy? Uh, basketball saved my life. He's going to tear that card up and go find someone else, right? So I waited till everybody left the room. Everybody left and handed in their card, and I went to the man and I said, "Look, here's the real deal." I made some bad choices as a teenager. I didn't have a lot of good guidance in my life. And I'm here at college trying to turn it around. I love to learn, but I'm not a classroom guy. So even though I picked on some of you, I know some of you got bored and fidgety here. I'm kind of the same way. I can't just sit, right? And we're coaches. So we like to move around. But I told this coach, I said, my coach, I said, look, I need this team right now because I need something to keep me here. Otherwise, I'm going to go right back to doing the same dumb stuff I was doing. And that man took a chance on me. I didn't play much my first year, but he took a chance on me. He understood that basketball can do a lot more for us in our lives than just win some ball games and just win some trophies. And so for me, I'm forever thankful to him. And I don't know what your kids' situations are. Some may have wonderful lives at home. Some may have miserable lives at home. Some may have some really bad things going on and you don't know because they walk in with a smile because practice is the only place they get away from that stuff. Whether it be some kind of abuse or just the family life is bad. Well, you don't know. You never know. So my biggest thing I can ask of you is, yes, I hope you develop these players to be better than what they are and I hope I gave you some tools for that. But I hope you never forget how important basketball can be to a kid's life and what it can do for them, whether they were on the wrong tracks like I was or they're on the right tracks. This game opens the world to us, and it's proven that right now with us being in the building together, sharing the game, and it can do any, you'd be surprised the things it can do for a kid, whether it be now or what they'll remember in the future. One of the greatest feelings, who's had this? Some of my older coaches, who's had this feeling? You coached a kid and you didn't see him for a long time and they came back to you and they were like, coach, thank you coach. You don't understand what you did for me. Man, the lessons you taught me,